All right, good morning, folks. Today is Thursday, March 30th, 2023. Welcome to episode number 334 of the Simply Cyber Daily Cyber Threat Briefing. I'm your host, Dr. Gerald Dozier. Let me get, let me get, hold on. Let me get centered on, on frame here. Jeez, first time, first time streaming. Uh, guys, I'm Dr. Gerald Dozier, and over the next 45 minutes, me, you, Nicholas Amagors, Duke Norris, Richard Diering, Anthony Richardson, and so many more of the Simply Cyber community are going to be getting together, covering the top cyber news stories of the day, and I'll be giving my expert opinion and analysis on each of those stories, on what it means to you as a practitioner, or if you're looking to break into the industry, we've got you covered. You definitely will be asked in an interview, how do you stay current in the industry? And guess what? Spoiler alert, this is a stellar answer. Now, before we get into it, I do want to say shout out and love to the stream sponsors who who endorse the stream and keep it so I can do uh, quality of life updates and keep you guys rocking and rolling. Starting off with my good friend, Eric Taylor. Uh, you may know Eric Taylor for such uh, hits as double 50 sub gifted subs on uh, Monday show this week. Uh, and also uh, sp spicy hot takes from what's on your radar. E Eric Taylor, people. He runs Barricade Cyber Solutions, a fantastic company. They are dedicated to helping businesses from cyber attacks and recover from the damage done. Cyber attacks can cause massive issues for businesses and send dedicated, hardworking business owners into turmoil. But Barricade Cyber Solutions knows how to mitigate the damage done by cyber incidents. Check them out at barricadecyber.com. Links in the description below. I got their website on stream right now with me. If you scroll down to the bottom of barricadecyber.com, you can see Eric's calendar. You can even get up with this guy on a Saturday. There is no off limits, no boundaries for Eric Taylor. Click on it, grab a, grab a meeting with him. You can meet with him at 4.30 today, although I wouldn't do that simply because we have Simply CyberCon uh, live stream later today. More about that in a little bit. But get on Eric's calendar. Talk about how Barricade Cyber can help you. Also want to say love to XM Cyber, guys. Whoops, hold on. Let me change that screen here. I had a contractor at my front door <laughs> right before the stream started. Guys, XM Cyber, if you don't know about them, let me introduce you to them. Instead of, um, hold on, let me introduce you to them. Everybody's business has misconfigurations, vulnerabilities, mismanaged creds, exposures, both in the cloud and on-prem. And typically all you do is see kind of like slices of these things. Oh, we know we've got a vulnerability scanner. We see these phones. Identity and access management, they handle all the creds. It's a hot mess on fire. And you can't really see how it all interrelates and what your actual cyber risk is. This is where XM Cyber comes in. They've introduced a way for you to address your hybrid cloud exposures. So instead of looking at it in these slices, they actually combine all of those pieces together into a very visually appealing attack graph um, that allows you to proactively you know, uncover visually hidden attack paths, security control gaps in your infrastructure, both on-prem and in cloud, and how those two interrelate so you could pivot from cloud onto on-prem, right? Not good. You can actually pinpoint and prioritize. This is where the real value comes in. Uh, prioritize the issues that need to be fixed. Clear up those choke points and give yourself laser focused, laser focused remediation. Believe that. Go ahead, visit xmcyber.com. There's a link in the description below to demo their exposure management platform and see what it is that I'm talking about. Also, much love to Panopsi, uh, but more about them at the mid roll. Let me let me move this all the way down to the mid roll so I don't forget about good old Panopsi, Brandon Pools Group. Guys, I want to remind you that each episode of the Daily Cyber Threat Briefing is worth half a CP. So don't be shy. Say what's up in chat. Hashtag Team Live if you're here live with us. I see 128 of you at this time. Uh, we can do better than that. Those are rookie numbers, right? Let's pump those numbers. So uh, 128, hashtag Team Live. If you're watching on replay, I do love me some Team Replay people. We tried the Simply Cyber Community Challenge, so don't think that I'm dismissing that because uh, I don't love myself some Team Replay. Drop a comment in Team Replay, uh, especially on YouTube. I do enjoy uh, engaging with the Team Replay people in the comments asynchronously. And then, of course, my favorite, 
Hashtag passive observer. If you're socially introverted, if you've been kind of nervous about how to do networking, if you have imposter syndrome and feel like you have nothing to kind of add or contribute or that the, the community is going to call you out or whatever, bump that, push that aside, take your first step into networking, type hashtag passive observer in chat right now and watch what happens when the Simply Cyber community gets to know you, gets to meet you. One, there we go, Anthony Dilka. Good morning, Anthony. First one to step into the light. Welcome, Passive Observer Anthony Dilka. Also want to give a shout out to my beautiful bride, my lovely wife, who is also a hashtag Passive Observer in stream from time to time. All right, guys, sit back, relax. And let's get into the top cyber news of the day. Let it wash over us in an awesome wave. From the CISO series, it's cybersecurity headlines. It's Thursday, March 30th, 2023. Flaw found in Wi-Fi protocol. According to a technical paper published by researchers at Northeastern University, the IEEE 802.11 protocol contains a fundamental security flaw, opening the door to attackers tricking access points to leaking network frames in plain text. This exploits a behavior in access points when they enter into a power saving mode where they can queue frames to send on wake up. Attackers can spoof a device on the network to send a power saving frame to an AP, forcing it to start queuing frames, which can then be transmitted back to the device on a forced wake up. With this data in a shifted authentication context, the attackers can inject data into the TCP connection. Cisco acknowledged the flaw, but said any data obtained would be of minimal value in a securely configured network. All right. So a couple things. One, ooh, look at this graph. Look at this. Look at this. This is um, clearly a, um, excuse me, like a network traffic basic graph. You see this um, a lot of times when you're talking about client um, and attacker. And then in this instance, they have the access point as well. Um, okay, guys. So this is actually pretty important. Oh, and by the way, Paula Terranova with the 10 gifted subs. What? Did we just become best friends? Yep. Thank you so much, Paula, for allowing 10 other individuals to experience the glory that is being a Simply Cyber community squad member. Way to go, SSD and Matthew Pelkey and all the other ones who had an opportunity to get in on the squads. Thanks, Paula. Very, very generous of you. Okay, so you don't see this very often, guys. Everybody's heard of 802.11. And if you haven't, now you have. And we can say <laughs> with confidence, everybody's heard of 802.11. 802.11 is the wireless uh, protocol, right? So for wireless traffic to communicate, uh, whether it's in managed mode, which is what most of us are common, or you've done some wireless hacking and you've put it in promiscuous mode, monitor mode, pa doing packet injections, all of the behavior that is done with that conforms to the 802.11 protocol okay protocols i'm not going to get up here on too high a horse but dude protocols are so 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 important protocols allow interoperability of systems if we didn't have protocols systems wouldn't talk to each other correctly and i want to just i yeah i know about the 3cx i i, I want to just remind you guys like back in the day there used to be like like we didn't have standards on protocols, so systems really couldn't talk to each other. You started getting kind of like these um, siloed systems or systems not being able to talk to each other or adapters and all this other crap. So when we when we get like TCP as a protocol, right, like that is what we all use. Now for Wi-Fi 802.11, it's been around a while. It's gone through iterations, 802.11a, b, g, n, x, right? There's been multiple different ones, and it's usually either introducing security or performance um, improvements. Well, when the actual f protocol itself has a fundamental flaw, that is not good because it affects all 802.11. Now, as they pointed out in the research paper that a properly secured wireless network will not be as impacted uh, with this weakness as you could imagine, uh, it's still an interesting piece of academic research to get out there. IEEE, I would assume, would want to rectify this somehow it's just the thing is with any change management you can't just like what they said was basically the way you send a frame to put a um like when an access point goes to sleep it'll start queuing up traffic and then when it wakes up again it'll blast the traffic out it's basically like queuing the traffic up right and that's a performance benefit well i guess the the thing is you can send a frame to force it to sleep 
and then you can inject your own traffic into it. So it'll queue it up and then you wake it back up and it blasts it out. Right. It's like basically like holding back a Nerf gun, loading it up with your own, you know, attacker Nerf bullets and then letting it rip afterwards. Okay. That's fine. Really interesting. This is academic. And like they said in the story, this isn't like we need to burn down 802.11. So don't worry about this. Uh, I would be interested in to hear what Cody Kinsey has to say about this. I'd also think you could look for um, uh, air, air, oh my God, air, aero dump, not aero dump, air, um, not air crack, the, the one in the middle, air, air, air crack, air, Armageddon, maybe. What, what, there's like a really famous wireless attack module um, that people use, and I would be surprised if it didn't include this in the near future, given how serious this is environmental activists targeted by threat actors. Court records revealed that Aviram Azari, an Israeli private detective, operated a years-long cyber campaign targeting environmental activists, both individuals and organizations like the Rockefeller Family Fund and Greenpeace. He hired out his operations, with court records showing him hiring threat actors based in India. Authorities arrested Azari in 2019, and he pled guilty to hacking conspiracy, wire fraud, and identity theft last year. It's unclear who hired Azari, and his attorney said he isn't cooperating with the investigation. All right. Um, so, I mean, this is pretty cool in, in, in that this is basically like, you know, big time espionage, big time. This is almost like this almost seems like a collision between hacktivism and espionage. Um, So big oil, you know, big oil is, you know, just a close cousin to big tech as far as like money and power and influence. And, you know, basically it looks like big oil, right? This is all speculation based on what I'm seeing here. Big oil concerned about climate activism used their big oil money to hire very sophisticated social engineers, physical security testers to infiltrate <laughs> a, you know, climate opposition, obviously big oil, you know, like basically big oil saw this as a, a threat to them and they hired hackers to get into their operations. And it looks like they went for more than a year in that operation. So at that point they have um, Intel on, you know, who the key players are. They have Intel on what activist type events protests, sit-ins, strategies, all that. And, uh, you know, th that's what's going on. Now, it does say oil giant not accused of wrongdoing, which is interesting because the title says Exxon's climate opponents were infiltrated. Like, why even bring in Exxon then if the oil giant's not accused of wrongdoing? Somebody hired, somebody hired this, um, this, this group, right? This uh, Azari guy to hack in and get access to all these accounts and stuff. So to me, this is a um, very much a well-executed, well-funded, uh, sophisticated cyber you know, espionage attack. So no surprise. I, I almost feel like you'd be the equivalent, if, if you guys are older, it's the equivalent. What's up, Michael Adams and Logrick? Good to see Logrick. Passive observer. Guys, this is the equivalent. If you're old enough to remember when big tobacco was like a thing and they were pushing back that cigarettes didn't actually cause you harm, it'd be like big tobacco hiring uh, hackers to hack into, uh, you know, anti tobacco lawyer accounts and stuff like that. So this will be interesting to see. It just goes to show you how concerned um, big oil is with the um, climate activists and stuff like that. So we'll see. It's, it's a nice little case study on the fact that, you know, if you are at a large enterprise, you've got to be mindful of, you know, your attack, your attack exposure, right? This is, this story, unfortunately, is why small businesses uh, say things like, oh, we're too small to get hacked, right? Open letter calls for an AI pause. Over 1,000 people signed an open letter calling for all AI labs to immediately pause for at least six months the training of AI systems more powerful than GPT-4. Signees include Elon Musk, Steve Wozniak, Stability AI founder and CEO Ahmad Mostak, and Tristan Harris of the Center for Humane Technology, as well as some engineers from Google and Meta. 
The letter argues a level of planning and management isn't happening, with the industry instead locked in an out-of-control race to develop ever more powerful models. No one from OpenAI or Anthropic signed the letter. De All right. Yeah, and if, if you guys want to follow along, all the stories are in the description of the show. Thank you, Aaron KG, for the uh, support. Guys, um, yeah, stop Skynet. That's Peter Lee's nailing it right here. Okay, guys, so all of us know about ChatGPT. All of us have been using it. I've been using it. I used it yesterday, <laughs> like, multiple times. It's very powerful, okay? Now, these signatories are influential people, smart people people, thinkers, and they're saying a pause for at least six months. And I guess it's to uh, wrangle in what would be a, uh, a methodical, deliberate way of moving forward with research. I am very, very, very sad to report, first of all, Shall we play a game? Th there's a big problem here. Okay. I and I said this, like, not that I'm some type of freaking you know visionary or anything like that i'm not by any means but i said this when chat gpt launched right i've been doing this stream since before chat gpt blew up i said this the day it blew up okay you cannot put the genie back in the bottle you cannot put toothpaste back in the tube people have seen what this technology can do and they want it. They use it. There's like a million videos on YouTube. How to make $1,000 with ChatGPT. How to start up a business with ChatGPT. How to run an Instagram account, Pinterest account, Etsy account. How to make money, right? There's a massive wealth disparity right now, at least in the United States. So people are looking for any way to get paid, especially you know in this kind of gig economy, hustle economy. And when this tool is out there saying, bro, like we can do this and people are demonstrating it. Okay. I'm just talking about individuals. I'm not even talking about businesses yet. People aren't going to want it to stop. Second of all, businesses like business businesses are all about, I, I don't know. Let's guess. Straight cash, homie. Thank you, Randy. Straight cash, homie. If businesses can leverage chat GPT to write marketing copy, to do sales, to generate stories, scripts, blog posts, write a, write a compelling testimonial, right? If it can all do this, and you know what chat GPT costs? I don't know, a couple bucks a month. I, I don't even pay for the full version. It's probably like 10 bucks a month, 20 bucks a month, whatever it is. Do you know how much one employee costs? I got news for you, significantly more than 20 bucks a month. And you need more than one employee to do all the tasks that ChatGPT does. So businesses that are driven by money aren't going to want this to go away. Individuals who are trying to scrape by and, 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 and dig out of debt or, or whatever, like whatever their situation is, they're not going to want it to go by. And by the way, the companies that are making the AI, there's a little bit of a competitiveness going on in there. They're not going to want it to go by. So here's my thing. I appreciate that these 1,100 thinkers want us to put a pause on it because it's basically outpacing our ability to think through what is going to be the impact of having this AI as it gets smarter and faster and more widespread. But I don't think any amount of signatures are going to stop it because. There's too much money in it. It's like literally, like, here's what you're suggesting. You're suggesting that, hey, <laughs> like everybody stopped doing it, except these people over there. And those people are now going to have a competitive advantage because they're going to be moving forward while we're waiting for six months, right? And I know they listed out a couple people and it isn't, incre it's not exactly um, all wealthy people, but, you know, Elon Musk and Steve Wozniak, I mean, they, they, they don't need money. You know what I mean? So again, at the end of the day, the power of chat GPT combined with the power of money is the reason the genie will not go back in the bottle. We'll see where this goes. To me, this is just, I mean, this isn't even a cybersecurity story, frankly, but this is not, um, you know, it's too late. <laughs> Basically, it's too late. This is too late servicing giant exposes financial data. 
The firm NCB Management Services sent out breach notification letters disclosing a cyber attack it detected on February 4th. According to documents filed with Maine's Attorney General, the attack exposed personal data on just under 495,000 people. This included names, addresses, phone numbers, driver's license numbers, social security numbers, credit card numbers, and routing oh. numbers. The company claims it obtained assurances that the third party no longer has any information on its systems, indicating it paid some sort of a ransom. This appears to target closed credit cards originating from Bank of America. Bank of America will provide victims with two years of identity theft protection. And now we're... Well, <laughs> two years of identity theft protection. Thanks. Thanks. I mean, it, think about like, okay, so the people who uh, were exposed in this are people that have um, debt that is past due. Debt buying companies buy debt that is past due, right? So like I owe, like, let's just say like I owe a thousand dollars on my Chase credit card and I don't pay it for 90 days or whatever. And Chase, uh, you know, they're going to add fees and fines and all this other crap. But at some point, Chase is going to write it off their book and they're going to sell it to a debt giant. Okay. Now, what does this mean? Well, if I owe a thousand dollars, they'll sell it to the debt giant for a hundred dollars, right? So they buy the debt for, you know, 10 cents on the dollar. And now the debt giant, it's they're they're on the hook to recover the money, which is their business, right? And if they get anything over the $10, they're making profit, right? They're going to go for the full 100%, but maybe they uh, maybe they come to an agreement and they get 70%, right? That's what these people do. But like, these aren't, like the people who are involved in this, the, the compromise, they're not, um, like they obviously don't have finances or they would, they'd have been going after them for that. So, you know, it, it's, it sucks because you're already, you're already a hurt population of people and then to get this blows and then sorry so whatever this this debt giant company they should have had better uh infosec it didn't really get into um it didn't really get into how they were compromised but i mean look at this information right email address date of birth pay amounts driver's license employment positions credit card numbers routing numbers account balances like the fact that they have all that information is kind of gross to begin with. They can see your your bank accounts and stuff, um, but this is a total, this is a total package on committing straight identity theft. So you know who you know who would um, benefit with these five hundred thousand records? Uh, just to like play it forward, if you were asked in an interview to kind of like explain this and maybe what's the risk, Lazarus Group has six hundred million dollars in crypto. They can't get it out. Why do they need to get it out? They need uh, legitimate bank accounts that they can transfer crypto in like Coinbase or Binance, and then be able to, um, um, uh, not export, but like cash out, right? How do you do that? Well, here's 500,000 accounts that they can open and they have all of this information to legitimize, um, that, that, they, that it's a legit account. Anyone that checks any of this information, it's going to check out. So I would, I would almost think, look for that. Um, so whatever. This is why, guys, as for an individual, this is why I strongly encourage you freeze your credit if you can. It is a wicked pain in the butt if you uh, need to like get uh, take a loan out, buy a house, buy a car. It's a wicked pain in the butt, but you can thaw your credit now for like you know seven days or whatever. It's not too bad, but you should freeze your credit. You should freeze all the credit of everyone. Um, it's the only way to protect from identity theft like that. Um, but anyways, these guys got ransomware. Somebody, somebody made out. Here's here's the final thing I'll say on this. And if Eric Taylor or the people who or Joel Belt and the the people who kind of troll on the dark web, if you saw this one and know how much they got paid, I'd be curious. But guys, the final thing I'll say about this, right? Threat actors will look at who they've got compromised, right? And then they decide how much to make the um the ransom. And it's usually like seven percent of of uh annual revenue okay so this is ncb management services come on load up here revenue 75 million dollars i can't imagine 75 million so 10 percent would be 7 million 7 percent would be like you know whatever a roughly four million dollars five million dollars so so some threat actors probably got north of two million dollars easily 
north of $2 million easily. So, and, uh, you know, half a million people got screwed. From our sponsor, Trend Micro. Cybersecurity is not just about protection. It's about foresight, agility, and resilience. Navigating a new era of cyber risk demands evolved strategies, new frameworks, and integrated tools to equip security teams to anticipate and defend against even the most advanced attacks. Trend Micro, the global leader in cybersecurity, is bringing the cyber risk conversation to more than 120 cities around the world in their latest Risk to Resilience World Tour, the largest cybersecurity roadshow of its kind. Find the closest city to you and register today to take a leap towards a more resilient future. Head to trendmicro.com slash CISO series. Google. All right, it's the mid roll. Yes. All right, I want to take a hot minute and thank you for being here, chat. We're at 208 people. That's a great crew. I see a lot of support in the comments, in the chats. Shakira, I'm glad that your frozen credit saved you from identity theft. Well done. Thank you to the stream sponsors, Barricade Cyber, XM Cyber, and my good friend, Brandon Poole over at Panopsi. I didn't tell you about Panopsi before, but let me take a hot minute and let you know that Panopsi Security services businesses of any size. And the one service that I want to tell you about is their quantified risk assessment methodology. Now, many of us, when we just say risk assessment, or if you've taken the GRC course, you know about risk assessment, but that's a qualified technique that I teach you in the GRC class. This is where you have like heat maps and low, medium, high. A quantified risk assessment uses evidence-based information and outputs statistical ranges on risk exposure and return on investment, right? So the easiest way to say it is like, you know, at the end of the day, you're like, you have between a 22 and 28% chance of getting ransomware attacked this year. If you do invest in privileged access management or network segmentation, which would cost between 20 and $40,000, you can reduce your risk down to 12 to 18% of risk exposure to a ransomware attack. Okay, quantified risk assessments take more time, they cost more money, but they give you way more actionable intel. So if you do it once, you can kind of ride the coattails for about two, three years. All right. Thank you, Panopsi, for your continued support uh, and me making up the marketing copy. I, I swear to God, Brandon Poole just wants to support the channel. I haven't heard from him since <laughs> since uh, he uh, sent the, uh, the support. Guys, if you don't know about the newsletter, I send out an email on Mondays. I send out one in partnership with Codename Purple on Wednesdays. Let me know in chat what you think of the Wednesday email. It's industry-specific threat intelligence that you can use and tee up for the industry that you're working on. Or if you're going to interview for a company, use it, right? You're going to go interview at an energy company, read the energy one. You're going to go interview at a transportation logistics company, read that one. You know what would be really interesting to the person interviewing you? If you knew something cyber related in their industry, it will resonate, it will make you look like even more of an all-star than you already are. Take advantage, sign up. It doesn't cost anything. I'm like emphatic about it. All right. Simply Cyber Community Challenge. My friend Jojo, Joseph Dunmore yesterday, uh, picked up the baton and ran with it. Jojo, I loved connecting with you. I hope all of you found Jojo's post on LinkedIn and connected with both Jojo, Joseph Dunmore, as well as everybody else who commented in the comments, including you. Build your own network, people. Jojo, who are you going to tag? Let us know in the chat, Jojo, who you're going to tag. While you're doing that, it is What's Your Meme Thursday. Uh, mods, please keep an eye out for Jojo. Uh, if we don't get some... Oh, Alicia Jerry. All right. Alicia Jerry, you're on it. Guys, it is What's Your Meme Thursday. Dan Reardon, a.k.a. Ha Haircut Fish, comes up with a couture uh, meme every single Thursday. I don't get to see it beforehand. I mean, I see it, but I don't get any input on it. If you're familiar with the show Home Improvement from Tim Allen from the 90s, uh, you might you might recognize this one. It's all about more power, more RAM, more, 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 more. There we go. Thank you, Haircut Fish Dan Reardon. Thank you so much for the continued excellent What's Your Meme Thursday. Alicia Jerry, I look forward to your post. Jared Matthews with two interviews today. Yes. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> That's right, Peter Lee. Love it. All right, much appreciated. Guys, let's send some good vibes. 
Let's send some good vibes to Jarrett Matthews today. You got this, Jarrett. Go crush it. And Jarrett, I just want to remind you, stay, Jarrett Matthews, if you can, stay through to the end uh, the jawjacking, and I'll show you the SOC Analyst Q&A interview video I have that has been really well received. Warns about spyware zero days. In a blog post by Google's Threat Analysis Group, researchers disclosed it began tracking over 30 spyware vendors working with government actors. The post says these countries would otherwise not be able to develop similar spyware tools on their own. The post also details two targeted campaigns using zero-day attacks against Chrome, iOS, and Android. One used an iOS remote code execution flaw to send links over SMS that ultimately delivered a GPS location ping back to the attackers. Another targeted multiple flaws in Samsung's internet browser to install a full spyware suite on the device. Google reported all vulnerabilities in the report to impacted vendors who have patched the issues. All right, um, just looking here. The exploit chain tag recovery was delivered to the latest version of Samsung browser running Chromium 102. <clears throat> okay. So, you know, it's kind of interesting here. They're saying that commodity malware, right? Commercial spyware, commodity malware, right? Uh, is exploiting zero days. And I would also encourage you to go check out tag um, the threat analysis group at Google. They do excellent work. I'm going to go ahead and drop a link in chat. Definitely worth a blog post read. Spyware vendors use zero days and end days against popular platforms, okay? According to the, the, the news article, basically, um, they're, like, they can target you know, up-to-date Samsung uh, devices, specifically the browser on the device. Samsung obviously rolls their own version of some type of Chrome browser. I'm sure it's, it's so, uh, I'm sure it's so that they can, you know, harvest the data that you're putting in there if they have control of it themselves. Uh, but there are vulnerabilities and weaknesses in there and commercial spyware is, uh, exploiting it. Here's the deal. If you're in the business of, of selling spyware, right? How are you measured? How can you sell your product, right? Uh, guys, I'm like really, really hot on, on think of the business of it, okay? Because it, guys, at the end of the day, it took me, I'm 43. It took me like 40 years to figure it out. Great cash, homie. It's all about money. It's all about money. You trace anything back, it goes to money, okay? With some exceptions, activism is one of them. But if you look at why the people who are, you know, there's money on the other side of it, okay? So here's the deal. You're a spyware company. You're selling it to governments, law enforcement, criminals, wh whoever your client base is. How do you measure your effectiveness on how successful you can deploy it? If you can say we have the ability to compromise over a hundred different devices. We have exploitation in 75 countries, right? Like these are metrics that compel someone to say, I will use your spyware and I will pay for it. It's commercial. They're trying to make money, people. So how do you stay effective? If you don't update your tooling and make it work all the time, then people won't buy your product and then you're out of business. So by exploiting zero days and end days, which means recently discovered ex uh, vulnerabilities that do have a patch, but a lot of people haven't patched yet, those, that's what end day is. And I can explain later on Jawjack. And if you want more information on end days, by doing this, you're keeping your product competitive in the market. I get that it's a dark web criminal marketplace, but at the end of the day, my criminal spyware versus Kimberly's criminal spyware, we're both selling the same product, right? So how do we compel? We, we, we update it to make sure it does things. And that's what's happening here. Um, guys, you can't really stop a zero day, right? All you can do is defense in depth, educate your end users to be mindful of what, um, of what, um, phishing, you know, attacks look like attachments, the Linus tech tips, all that stuff, right? Like be mindful of all that. And if you are a you know, uh, if you're a political figure, if you're an investigative journalist, if you're a dissident, if you're an, uh, you know, an anti, you know, whatever the current power regime is, if you're anti that, uh, you may want to consider having, you know, burner devices or dedicated devices or whatever uh, in order to kind of protect from this. But that's about it. That's all you got. Defender sending URL false positives. Microsoft confirmed on Twitter that Microsoft Defender began mistakenly flagging otherwise legitimate links as malicious. 
The company also said that. Hey, really quickly here, uh, Rishik Leash Bungaj. Uh, yeah, the the ISO twenty seven thousand one um is a paid document. You can't please please like don't ask for pirated material in here. Okay. Some alerts in Defender do not show content as expected. Users can still access legitimate URLs despite the alerts, although anecdotally admins report being inundated with dozens of alerts since early on the morning of March 29th. As of this recording, Microsoft seems to still be investigating the issue. It says it began reviewing service telemetry to isolate the root cause and develop a remediation plan. All right. So this is interesting. Okay, so I'm going to take this in a slight direction, okay? So my SecOps people um, or, or anyone who's interested in becoming a SOC analyst or working in security operations, right? We have tools. We have tooling that allows us to configure it, tune it, and then it'll help us, right? It'll block fishy emails. It won't allow click-throughs on malicious URLs and stuff like that. Well, when it gets it right, that's a true positive, right? And that's how the system should work perfectly, okay? now. We get false positives, which is what this is, where it's a legit URL. It goes to simplycyber.io, but um, Microsoft flags it as malicious. That's a false positive. There's also a false negative where it is a malicious link and it doesn't detect it. It says it's okay and it gets through. And we see phishing emails get through from time to time. And it just means that your tuning needs to happen. Now, what happened here is likely likely some type of rule set or some type of um, condition or um, uh, you know value like oh if it meets these three things it's malicious and maybe that value got downgraded to like two things or one thing or something about the URLs was kind of fishy like maybe it used a um, puny code if you guys have heard of puny code uh, threat actors are using puny code in order, which is basically like, you know, the, the German letter, uh, if Doris is in here or Gregor, <laughs> I'm going to butcher this, but like the German, like E with the two dots or the, U or whatever, you know, the, the, or the U, like, I think in Belgium or something like the, U, the, U, right. Like whatever that is. Um, and my, my apologies for being like an ignorant <laughs> American, if I'm saying those wrong, like threat actors will put those in. So instead of bank of America, it's B and then the A with the two dots in K of America and, and they'll get through. But that is like a t tall tale sign of a malicious URL. So what I, everything I'm trying to tell you right now is that Microsoft Defender was tuned in some way to flag those URLs as malicious. And these were false positives. Okay. So. You know, it just, Defender is going to need to tune it up a little bit more, but we see this in the environment all the time. And the final thing I'll say about this to, t to tie it to something, and we saw this with the SOC Analyst Home Lab, you might think in your mind, thanks for the sub, Pon Ponkaj, like you might think in your mind, oh, like this is bad, block it. This is bad, block it. Well, what you really should be doing, and you should share this at a job interview, is you should configure a rule to detect it and then monitor it. Yes, some malicious stuff can get through, some bad stuff can get through, but by de by looking at it first and detecting it, you can validate that the rule you're writing is a high fidelity rule, meaning it catches bad and allows good to go through. If you write some brittle, janky rule that basically is gonna block everything, it's not going to work. The business is going to choke on it. And the final, final thing I'll say, this is why DLP or data loss prevention fails in like every organization I have ever seen. If you're in chat right now and you've tried, uh, if you've ever worked on a DLP project or seen DLP get rolled out at a business, let me know in chat if you ever saw it work right. I've seen it three times in my own professional experience. And guess what? Three times it failed. Basically, you turn it on, everybody freaks out, you throttle it back, everybody freaks out, you basically turn it off, and everybody's like aces, and then you basically have a, a nerfed DLP solution that you're paying for that isn't blocking or isn't detecting anything going out. It's a mess. That's what's going on here. Um, you know, whatever. Give me some snake eyes. It's been a minute. Snake eyes, the more you know. Dunk, 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 dunk. Christopher Cahill, hold on one second. Um, James K says that it worked right. Interesting. Yeah, it's very rare for DLP to work. API attacks up 400%.
That finding comes from Salt Security's State of API Security Q1 Report 2023, which found the increase over the last six months. Of these, 80% occurred over authenticated APIs. Digging into the report, 17% of survey respondents saw an API-related breach in the quarter, while 94% experienced security issues with APIs in production. This resulted in 59% of respondents saying they slowed new application rollout. Just under half of all respondents said API security had reached C-level discussions in their organization. Okay, guys, <clears throat> this shouldn't be as a surprise to anyone. APIs are application programming interfaces. They allow software to talk with software, right? So when you have any app um, that interfaces with any other app, they use an application programming interface, right? Uh, this is how automation is done. This is like if you write a Python script to auto post to Twitter every time Elon Musk's uh, plane takes off and you pull that from a, data, a public database and then craft it up and then send it, you're using an API to interface with that database and you're using an API to interface with Twitter, which by the way, Twitter is now charging for API interfaces. But anyways, there, there's APIs all over the place, right? You're exposing part of the functionality of an application to allow extension, to allow mods, to allow the community to integrate with it, right? This is like Zap Zapier, Z-A-P-I-E-R, Zapier. Their entire business is literally about connecting APIs to APIs in a very easy way for anyone to digest. Tines, T-I-N-E-S, Tines is a business that does that. It's like a whole markets around this. So it's no surprise that attackers are upgrading to API attacks because APIs are everywhere. So to me, there's a larger attack service. There's a larger population of potential APIs to hack. And they're more successful because sometimes APIs are misconfigured. Sometimes API secrets are left in public uh, repo codes like GitHub and stuff like that, API secrets. Um, and, and, and basically, you can just attack and, and get into that. If you're doing bug bounties, um, to me, this is an indicator right here that maybe you should focus on APIs if you're doing bug bounties. Clearly, the attackers are doing it. So the, the bounties are probably going to go up and clear the attackers are being successful. So there's probably a, a rich attack surface for security researchers. I don't know why I did air quotes on that for security researchers to, um, you know, get paid for bug bounties. So definitely look into that. I know Alyssa Knight, she's really focused on, um, Alyssa Knight's really focused on, uh, night studios and, and, and content production and, and, and movie studio stuff, but she, um, has done a ton in the API security space. I don't know. I think she wrote a book on it. That still may be valuable. Um, APIs are really, really fun, but you can't, you know, there's a lot of attack surface guys. Plus not everybody's logging um, how APIs are being called and stuff like that. So you can do all sorts of fun stuff. Cybersecurity education bill passes in North Dakota. The U.S. state of North Dakota has passed a law requiring schools to teach cybersecurity in classes, yes. all the way from kindergarten to grade 12. A plan for the classes must be approved by July 1, 2024. It's the first U.S. state to require cybersecurity classes. Work on the bill began back in 2015. In addition, the state will also offer all residents of North Dakota online classes in cybersecurity, networking, and programming. Okay. Okay. Heck yeah. So um, the fourth grade class that watches this stream, yes, all right, I love it. You guys are already ahead of the curve, but way to go, North Dakota. I got to tell you, gun to my head, I would not have thought North Dakota would have been the first state to do this, lead the charge. Nothing, no, 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 nothing against North Dakota. I got mad, you know, love for all the U.S. states, but it just, I, you know, I wouldn't, North Dakota is definitely not on my list. Guys, I have been quietly championing, like, STEM STEM, science, technology, education, and math. Is that what the E stands for? STEM has been like this term to like basically make science and technology a, a priority, right? As the United States has slowly started sliding backwards in the world as far as like technology development and um, research and development and stuff like that. Thank you, engineering. STEM has come out as like, we really got to push this and get them young and everything like that. I was firmly on the track. And you've, if, you, if you're a longtime supporter of Simply Cyber, you may know what I'm talking about. But like I've said STEM C, like we need to call it STEM C. Um, 
<laughs> STEM C, right? Get cyber in there. And that's what they're doing. Guys, they're introducing it at the elementary and middle schools. I love this. I love this. I love this. I love this. It's hold on. Cybersecurity I'm education in, in high school. I love it. Love it. Love it. Yes. In middle school. I love it. I love it. I love it. Thanks, Finn Frock, for the um, for the dub. Um, high schools are going to be doing it as well. I love this. I hope um, the, the final thing I'll say about this is I hope this is a trend. I hope other states get on board with this. I would love to see a federal um you know, kind of cyber core curriculum. I'd love personally to be part of a committee that helps define what um, what learning objectives uh, should be part of this curriculum. I would love that. I would love that. If anyone from the <laughs> if anyone from the state or from the federal government that would be involved in this is looking for another committee member. Uh, I'm on board with this. This would be super, super cool. I'm so pumped about this, guys. We talk about the 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 um the 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 the, the, the career workforce gap and all these other things. Like this is part of it, guys. We have to get them. It has to become part of standard living. Everybody is using the internet every single day. We're all integrating with technology all the time. You cannot be passive and pretend that like cybersecurity is someone else's problem. It's not. It th this is like taking cybersecurity, information security awareness training to to eleven. I love it. Making it part of the standard curriculum, getting people like acclimated to it. That's the thing. Once you know, like you can make way better informed decisions. I'm all on board with this. Imagine little young Carl. <gasps> you know, fourth grade Carl getting educated on this stuff. Yes. And this isn't even about like joining the workforce. Yes, you'll learn some of that. But to me, this is basic, basic, fundamental, protect yourself knowledge, right? Look before you cross the road left and right. Also enable multi-factor authentication on all your social media accounts and don't reuse passwords, right? Those two things should go hand in hand. You feel me? Yes. Way to go, North Dakota. We expect our users to be perfect security responders, even... Well, maybe we do, Steve Prentice, but in North Dakota, no no doubt, no doubt. Uh, real quick, I got a couple of things to share with you. If you were here just for the news, I love it. Don't go anywhere because I got two really cool things to share with you. Um, um, I want to thank all of you for being here really quick. Uh, Dan Reardon did comment. He wanted me to share that... Um, you know, it's Tim the Toolman Taylor. I'm Jerry the GRC Osier. Jerry the GRC Osier. <laughs> so thank you guys. I wanna I wanna share a couple quick things with you. Very important things, okay? Check this out really quick. Today is March 30th, 2023. Come on. Today is the beginning of Wicked Six. You can go to wickedsix.com. Wicked6.com for more information. This is a 24 hour Global hack event, Jack Scott, our very own outpost grade Jack Scott, uh, longtime Simply Cyber community member and co-author of um, the book that I authored, you know, with Jax, um, is the MC of this event. Go check it out. Uh, Haiku, one of the companies I work for, has built a custom range with an exclusive badge that you can earn. Um, it be, being part of this Wicked Six event. Way to go to Cat's Eye, Play Cyber, Wicked Six Cyber Games. Mary Galloway was on two weeks ago talking about this event. It's finally come. Go check it out. Be part of it. It's going to be wicked cool. So thank you very much to all the uh, individuals at Wicked Six doing all that great work. Guys, I also want to tell you, if you are interested, hey, if you were here just for the news, thank you all so very much. We'll see you next time. We're going to spend a few minutes jaw jacking. Later today at 4.30 p.m. Eastern Time, I am doing a live stream. I do a live stream every Thursday, normally with a, um, a guest from the community, uh, from the cybersecurity industry, sharing their thoughts and everything. InfoSec Pat, the YouTuber who does uh, uh, penetration testing videos on YouTube, very good guy, very good content. He was my guest, but he, he's a practitioner and he got called to a, an engagement last minute. So he had to cancel, but this is perfect because it's been a few weeks since we held our initial Simply Cyber Con live stream. We are putting on a conference. The Simply Cyber community is putting on a conference. It's gonna be sick. It's Wednesday, um, Wednesday, November 8th at 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. We're gonna have two tracks, events, speakers, merch, uh, like raffles, giveaways, good times, mentorship, 
uh, LinkedIn roasting. It's going to be bomb. Okay. It's been a few weeks. It's time for an update meeting. We have key people who have taken on key responsibilities, leading certain efforts, marketing, sponsorship, website, discord, um, um, uh, speaker tracks. Okay. This is today at 430. If you're interested in the Simply CyberCon, come at 430. I'll have the people who are uh, are the leading different uh, functions of the conference on stream with me. We will share updates on what we've been doing. And most importantly, I am so big on community involvement, community integration. I don't do Simply Cyber for me. I do Simply Cyber for you. So it's vitally important to me that you get to have input and feedback and constructive um, in in input on what this event looks like. Guys, this is a massive amount of work. Putting on a conference isn't like you push a button and it happens. It's a lot of work. And if I'm gonna put in the energy, if the other leaders are gonna put in the energy, I wanna make sure that it delivers on value. So we'll be submit, uh, soliciting feedback from you in chat. I hope you can join us. I hope you can be part of the solution. Thanks, Joel Belton. So 4.30 on LinkedIn, go ahead. I'll share a link here. Um, I'll share a link here. What the crap? I'll share a link here. Let's do this. For this is Simply CyberCon. Come join. Now, check this out. I got a wicked sick, it's a wicked sick update, okay? This is, okay, hold on. Let me go to this scene. Guys, check this out. So many of you, well, let me just, for those who don't know, I have, uh, I'm working on a course right now. It's going to be called Cybersecurity 101. And I might do Cybersecurity 102 also. But here's the deal. I think I might just make it one course. It is going to be a, very comprehensive course. Like, like it's going to be the equivalent of an entire college semester of content. And the idea behind it is when you're done taking this course, no prerequisites, obviously that's why I'm calling it Cyber 101. When you're done with the course, you'll have a very good understanding across the entire industry and I'm going to make it a focus to make sure that different jobs in the industry are covered at a depth enough that you'll understand what they are. Because I always get the question, oh, I want to work in cyber. What, what do I do, Jerry? And the next question is, well, what do you want to do? Well, I don't know. What do I want to do? Right? Well, here, let me develop a course where you're going to learn a million different things that are important and relevant to information security, but then also all the different roles. So when you're done with the course, you'll have the knowledge to say, okay, I want to be a malware analyst. Let's go. I want to be a SOC analyst. Let's go. Now that isn't news to everybody here. That was something I've already socialized. Here is the update. All right. I am collaborating with a college in the Northeast. Okay. Uh, on this course. And I have a meeting, I had a meeting with them last night to verify this. And I have a meeting in a couple weeks um, with the credit, um, the, the, the credit folks. Long story short, you guys don't need to care about the details. Long story short, this course is going to be worth college credits, okay? And what does that mean? How does that work, Jerry? You're not a college, don't worry about it. In the GRC Analyst Masterclass, I actually have all the content. And then as a bonus material, I have exactly how to get a GRC analyst job, right? I figure if I teach you all the stuff, why not give you a job? This one's gonna be Cyber 101, and then I'm gonna have an entire module on how, like with templates that I will write, all you have to do is put your name in it. I'll write the template, I'll develop the uh, workflow, and I will show you exactly how you can take this course, right? Very easy for you, because you're just gonna have to output the packet and put your name in it. Take this course that you've completed and take it to any college and be able to submit it for college credits. Now, I can't guarantee every college will accept it as credit, but I'm working with this college to make sure that the content I'm developing maps to college level curriculum, college level course credits, right? And once one's on board and it's defined, the packet I'm gonna give you it, it, it's it's going like all you have to do is give it like do what I'm telling you to do and most colleges will accept it if not all colleges and I'm probably going to focus on WGU first because WGU um, a lot of people uh, go there uh, but but here's my thing I can't go to the, every college for you and a lot of people don't even want to go uh, get college but if you want these as college credits it's going to be supported okay that's my that's my that's my bag and that's what I'm super excited about so holla 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 Oh, thanks, Alicia, Jerry. It'll be fun. I'm super pumped about it. So, 
Let's do that. Yeah, it, it is. I'm pretty excited. I mean, I'm excited about the course already. I already told you guys that I've been working with um, um, cyber ranges. There, there will be labs. Oh my God. There will be labs inside the um, course as well. I have like, I don't know, eight, eight or 10 labs. Um, yeah, so super exciting, super exciting, exhausting, but super exciting. All right, if more states do initiatives like this, it will lower costs, so it's worth it. Yeah, definitely. Going to be a WG grad this month. Way to go, Anthony Richardson. Wow. Nice, Frankie. I'm loving it. Got to mid-roll on my break. We'll catch the rest on lunch. No problem, mine runs. We'll be here, as always. <laughs> Love it. Also, I'm, uh, you know, if you guys are interested, I don't know if anyone cares, but I'm... I'm I'm strongly considering doing a quarterly uh, live in-person class, like the way John Strand does his his live um, classes. I'm thinking about doing one a quarter. Um, and I know I'm so busy and it's ridiculous to even assume this, but I, I feel like once I get the night studios thing tracking and get that going, I could, I could, I could, I could carve out a week, a quarter and, and do it. So Oh, Michelle Dane. Hey, it might not be cyber related, but make sure you're doing best practices for cybersecurity, right? Growth does hurt, Brady, but it's good. It's all good. You know what I mean? I try to move fast and, you know, break things. Like, you know, sometimes I do initiatives and they don't work. And I like simply cyber community challenge for team replay. But like, you know, that that didn't work. Maybe we'll re resurrect it. But, um, you know, so... All right, how are we doing on time? Let me look at my uh, clock here, make sure I'm not going to miss a meeting, per usual. I am not going to miss a meeting. Oh, SOC analyst interview stuff. Thank you so much, Jared Matthews. Thanks, guys. You guys always keep me... Uh, keep me... Um, on the ball here. So check this out. Here, here's a link. This is my website. This is my blog. Um, so Jarrett, Jarrett Matthews, Jarrett, can you confirm you got that? So this right here, this, this, this blog post, this video, here are all the actual questions with links directly to the responses. If you want to just jump to one, but this video is like 15 minutes long, Jarrett, and everybody who's got an interview. I cannot guarantee you that you'll be asked these questions on your interview. And this says SOC analyst interview, but the questions are kind of generic, right? So like some of them are SOC analysts, but some of them are just regular cyber. So they'll apply to any job. I have had more than a dozen people tell me that they got asked several of these questions in an interview and that this video helped them answer it correctly, confidently, and just dominate. And in many instances, they got the job. Again, I can't promise you a job. I can't promise you they'll ask these questions, but I didn't choose these 12 questions randomly. Okay. I did a bit of research on them. So get up on that. Yeah. Sean Washington knows I'm not making this up guys. I, I don't, I don't, I don't lie. So go out there, Jarrett Matthews. If you can take a minute, re review those things, um, please. And, uh, Bring back some good news, man. All right. Guys, I think that's going to do it. I got a boogie out of here. A lot going on. The, the, the lab. I think that's what we might call it. The Simply Cyber. The Simply Cyber Lab presented by Barricade Cyber Solutions um, is being delivered next Wednesday. Come, come. Come rain or shine. It was supposed to be this Wednesday and we pushed it because of the weather and probably shouldn't have. So we're going to do it next Wednesday. All right, guys, that's going to do it for me. Thank you all so very much. Very much appreciate the mods. Thank you mods for all your support and effort and keeping these things going. We'll see you guys at 4.30 p.m. Eastern time for Simply CyberCon. My son has soccer practices at 5.30 on Thursday, so it'll be a 45-minute show. All the best, guys. Be good, and until next time, stay secure.